Scott from John Off. It is a beautiful day in Casino, and uh, I thank Francesco for the introduction. Today, I will speak about steel, in particular, the microstructure of steel and how it might be associated with fracture, a specific type of fracture, intergranular fracture, and uh, I will discuss this. Uh, here is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I will talk about microstructure and ductal fracture of quench and tempered carbon steels. And what I would like to emphasize is that not all conditions are embrittled. Quite uh, far from this, most uh, heat treated conditions by now we know enough not to produce brittle intergranular fracture. But it does, it does appear. And uh, so I will emphasize that. So, uh, fractography, scanning electron microscopy, very important. It shows us the weakest part of the microstructure relative to fracture. And uh, so underneath these fracture surfaces, where cracking has occurred in steel, there are specific microstructures that we have been trying to identify. And then uh, once uh, I talk about this generally, uh, I will talk about four embrittlement phenomena, quench embrittlement, temper martensite embrittlement, temper embrittlement, and uh, the all-pervasive hydrogen embrittlement. And we heard a little bit about some of these yesterday. And then a very brief summary. Now, what the quenching tempering does is produce martensitic microstructures. And uh, what we've been learning is that uh, steels, uh, certainly mostly iron, carbon, but there may be 10 or more elements, other chemical elements, within the microstructure of steel. And uh, some are introduced by design to make the steel hardenable, to uh, increase strength, to increase toughness, and fracture resistance. But some of these elements that are present in steel are difficult to remove from steel making, and they can create problems. <laughs> in particular, phosphorus is an element that uh, one has to be very careful of controlling. Uh, uh, sulfur, which combines with manganese to make inclusions, has to be considered. And uh, uh, other elements, such as copper, which uh, would uh, negatively influence uh, hot work and, and which can't really be removed by steel making uh, are parts of these negative, somewhat negative elements in steel. Now, all of these elements are distributed in the many crystal components that make up a martensitic microstructural system. So, uh, over many years, uh, I've been trying to understand these systems, these components of microstructure that make up the overall microstructure. And uh, those are influenced by steel making, outline, hot and cold rolling, osmotizing, cooling, punching, tempering, and uh, uh, all of those. Those are processing factors. They influence uh, the crystals in the Martin City microstructures. Now, uh, here are the components. Uh, when we talk about my, microstructure, uh, here's a list of the many components of uh, a hardened microstructural system. Uh, inclusions, uh, they come with a steel making. They are uh, generally negative with respect to fracture. Uh, the uh, part 
of the microstructure are the martensitic crystals. How do we harden? We heat into the austenitic range at high temperatures, austenite, a face center cubic structure is stable. But when we cool that, when we crunch that, it transforms to a body center crystal structure. And that is martensite. And martensite does the hard work. So uh, steels are processed, then they're austenitized, and then they are quenched, and then finally they are tempered. So uh, the uh, martensite crystals, low, medium carbon steels, they're extremely fine. They are small. And, uh, uh, and they occur parallel one to the other in the microstructures. Uh, then uh, another important thing, because we austenitize, what happens during austenitizing is critical. Uh, we don't make 100% austenite. There are carbides, and, and certainly the inclusions don't go away, but the uh, carbides, uh, some carbides, uh, are retained and they influence uh, fracture, especially ductal fracture. Uh, then uh, the, the heart of plasticity is the dislocation substructure in the martensitic crystals. And the dislocations, uh, if they can cross slip, you, know, you may not be familiar with that dislocation structure, but their edge dislocations and their screw dislocations. The screw dislocations uh, can move from one crystal plane to another, and uh, they can actually uh, create the strain hardening and uh, uh, create high strength and hardness in steel, in quench steels. Then there are, uh, then there are structural features that come with temper. And uh, to preserve the highest strength possible, uh, the Martin structures are tempered at between 150 C and 200 C, 175 C. And uh, uh, so and those are transition carbides. We like to say that they are sedentite Fe3C, but no, they are a very fine crystal structure that impedes uh, dislocation motion and increases the strength of uh, these French and tempered steels. Then there's retained austenite. Not all of the austenite that is produced at the high temperatures survive, uh, is eliminated by martensite formation. And uh, the higher the carbon content of the steel, the more of the high temperature phase is retained in these smart city microstructures. And then I've outlined here the prior arsenic grain boundaries. This is where intergranular fracture occurs. What happened uh, during austenitizing is uh, carried over and becomes uh, a very sensitive microstructural element. Uh, in a quenching temperate structure and is related to these intergranular structures. Uh, intergranular, what does it mean? It means between the grains, between the crystals. Uh, and uh, so it's the high temperature crystal structure that survives uh, the, the quench. And then sometimes alloy carbides, nitrides, carbon nitrides, depending on what alloying elements are introduced in the steel. Now, uh, here are the microstructures. So, uh, this, is, this is what uh, you would see 500x. Uh, here is what is referred to as lath martensite. site. You can see that the crystals are parallel to one another uh, in packets or blocks, basically. And uh, it's fuzzy. And why is it fuzzy? Because uh, you, uh, the light microscope cannot resolve the finest crystal structures of the market side. So uh, you can see some of the crystals in these, uh, in the market side of being garden steel, 
But uh, the structure is so fine, light microscopy cannot resolve all of the finest crystals of martensite. And then uh, if you go to higher carbon steels, uh, for example, carburized steels that have 1% carbon, 0.8% carbon, uh, the morphology changes quite a bit. And uh, you get these non-parallel large crystals, and the white areas is the retained austenite that has not transformed during the quenching. Now, uh, to see the, the fine structure uh, requires electron microscopy. This is uh, uh, an image, dark field image, taken at 30,000 X. And so now we can see even the smallest martensite crystals. And since this is tempered at 100 degrees C, these small white patches here, those are the transition carbides that uh, help to create high strain hardening uh, of the uh, martensite structure. Uh, uh, in, in these last martensites, here's the leftover austenite. The, uh, the leftover austenite uh, is in between the fine crystals of martensite. And what is not shown is the dislocation structure that is the backbone of uh, ductal fracture, uh, ductal behavior, high strength behavior in these quench and tempered steels. Uh, here uh, is a set of uh, engineering stress strain curves uh, of uh, 43XX steels. XX meaning various carbon contents, 20.2, 0.3, 0.4, 0.5. And uh, uh, tempered at 150 degrees C. And uh, this is a high strength microstructure. And uh, uh, one of the important things here is that the uh, high strength and the high hardness, we, we talk about hard set steels, they have high hardness. This is due to the strain hardening, due to dislocations uh, interacting, cross slipping, uh, increasing in numbers and uh, uh, causing uh, very high ultimate tensile strengths. And uh, there's this very simple, uh, uh, the, uh, the ultimate tensile strength uh, can be simply calculated, the sigma the epsilon, which is strain hardening rate, effectively the slope of the curve, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the stress strain curve, where they intersect uh, marks the uh, uniform elongation associated with the uh, ultimate tensile strength. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the low carbon steels have less hardening, there's less carbides, fewer transition carbides, fewer dislocations, so not much strain hardening. So a lot of the uh, strain hardening happens after the mechanical instability, uh, basically. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and the higher the carbon content, the more dislocations, the more of these very fine transition carbides, the higher the strain hardening, and therefore the less post-uniform deformation is required uh, to produce fracture, because the stress is already so high. And uh, this is what uh, the uh, this is what ductal fracture is all about. Uh, once you reach the instability point, in other words, where a strain hardening uh, can't uh, keep up with the applied load, uh, then you start to initiate voids. The uh, dislocations pile up around hard particles, and uh, and micro voids are nucleated, they grow, and ultimately they grow uh, together. And here's ductal fracture uh, uh, of, of those steels uh, that are shown. Uh, and uh, microvoids, uh, this, is, this is the post-uniform fracture deformation. Uh, each one of these little voids has a hard particle. I found 
out over the years, and it took a long time uh, to find this, hardworking graduate students, which are really important. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it turns out that uh, uh, during austenitizing of these uh, medium carbon steels, there's a lot of carbides, hard carbide particles left over. And these microvoids form around those particles, uh, continued uh, deformation. Uh, if you have big inclusion particles, you get big voids in the structure. But these are fairly clean uh, structures. So this is double fracture. And, uh, but here is intergranular fracture. And uh, it got me a while to get to this point. But look at the difference here. These uh, surfaces outline the Austin the austenite uh, that was formed by the austenitizing heat treatment. And uh, uh, these are the boundaries between crystals of austenite. And uh, uh, fracture has proceeded along these and uh, very smooth, uh, no, no evidence of microvoid formation, etc. Occasionally a uh, crack will go through a grain. Uh, the, the heat treaters, that you use work very hard to produce tremendous structures within the austenite grains, but uh, 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 that's bypassed by these intergranular cracking mechanisms. So, uh, but but here's the difference: double fracture and the brittle intergranular fracture, very little evidence of plastic deformation here. So, brittle fracture is the absence or severe reduction of plasticity and dislocation motion on application of mechanical loading. And so you get severely reduced mechanical properties. Uh, intergranular fracture in carbon steels, two-dimensional cracks along prior Austenite grain boundaries. Questions, what microstructures, substructures, nanostructures are just below the cracks? What promotes these structures? So, so these are ongoing questions. Uh, uh, as Giovanni uh, indicated uh, yesterday, at least in terms of hydrogen cracking. And uh, here's a pretty bad example of uh, hydrogen charged uh, low carbon steel, E22 steel. Uh, this is steel used in automotives now. In other words, uh, automotive uh, steels for safety considerations need martensite, need the strength that comes with martensite. And uh, uh, if you charge with uh, hydrogen, you know, this is a laboratory experiment, uh, the, here's a factor here. Uh, without hydrogen, you get this tremendous strain hardening uh, and uh, post-uniform deformation, etc. Uh, but uh, with hydrogen, uh, you get a fracture in the elastic portion of the engineering stress strain curve. Now, uh, other types of uh, fracture uh, go uh, beyond yielding, uh, but never quite reach the uh, ultimate tensile. And uh, so uh, the different fracture mechanisms can have different degrees of severity. Now, here's a map uh, that I, I created. This is a map of tempered temperature. One thing, uh, we, we make martensite by quenching, but then we control the mechanical properties of the martensite by tempering. And, uh, uh, and most of the time, hopefully, we're OK. But here's where these integrator mechanisms can develop. Uh, quench and brittlement happens here. You know, we temper it between 100 and 200. It's OK, low carbon steels, but not in a high carbon steel. When high carbon content goes above 0.5%, then you uh, get quench and brittlement, you get this intergranular fracture. Then there's tempered martensite and brittlement, 
and temper abutment, higher temperature, and uh, 500. We, we heard a talk yesterday uh, about uh, chrome molly steels being uh, uh, heat treated and exposed to 540 degrees C. That's uh, that's the temperature range uh, where temper temper abutment might occur. And then there's hydrogen, and this hydrogen. We have to put it all over here. There is no good uh, performance due to hydrogen. So quench abutment. Quench abutment is a brittle integrating or fracture mode that develops as quench and low temperature tempered steels containing more than 0.5%. Low carbon steels, medium carbon steels are not affected. So uh, so this is uh, okay, I guess I have to move ahead a little bit. So, and the mechanism is cementite formation and also like grain package, doing oxidizing. We're doing quenching. Phosphor segregation enhances, but uh, doesn't uh, uh, cause it. Okay, moving along. Uh, here, mechanism. Now, uh, on these integrated fracture surfaces, you hardly see any smooth fracture. What's happening here? Well, cementite formation, carbide formation happens uh, uh, because those like grain boundaries are uh, uh, rough, uh, where crystal structures join and they are preferred nucleation sites for carbides and uh, cementite forms. But uh, the uh, okay. Okay, uh, here, here's another map, part of the map. This is tempering temperature. And uh, this, this is the critical range for high strength, basically, uh, between 100, 200, 175 C. And, uh, and you get double fracture. So if the carbon content is low or medium, there's not a major consideration. But if you go over 0.5%, you get the quench and grilling, and uh, uh, you get this structure. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the grain boundaries, uh, these integrated fracture surfaces, skinning electron microscopy, uh, you just don't see anything. Uh, occasionally, you can see, and this is not very often, you can see some cenotype that is formed. But it is cenotype that produces this, and uh, that is obtained by OJ electron spectroscopy. Low energy electrons, uh, carbon, these are detected. And, uh, and this is a rel relatively severe carbon peak. Uh, if you would uh, uh, irradiate an area within the austenite grains, away from the grain boundary, uh, this carbon peak would be very, very much smaller. So. Uh, this is evidence for cenotype forming on those oscillating grain boundaries in these high carbon steels. Now, mitigation. Well, obviously, okay, have I done something here? Okay. Uh, uh, use lower carbon, medium carbon steels. Uh, keep phosphorus content low. Uh, reduce the carbon content of grain boundaries by intercritical loss of function. Bearing steels. Uh, there's a bearing steel, 52 100, 1% 1 carbon. Deep into this range. I'm not, I'm not sure what's happening there. But uh, uh, the bearing steels, 1% carbon, uh, these are usable. So why are they usable? Because of intercritical loss of function. And then uh, 
Hitler is intercritical by now. And Victoria, can you do something to keep the computer not being uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay. So, uh, carburizers. Uh, why does it work? Carburizing. It introduces uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 percent carbon. And uh, uh, it is because the surface compressive stresses are introduced during the punching of the carburized steels. So uh, I will illustrate those. Uh, now, here's the iron carbon diagram. The not go complex is a little critical of this, but uh, uh, but. One way you can reduce the amount of carbon in the austenite that forms in the grain boundaries is to austenitize in this austenite percentite two-phase fuel. In other words, don't go up where you have 100% austenite, but uh, what you do, and, and this is typically applied to bearing steels, bearing steels to tremendous application for quench and tempered high carbon steels. And, uh, and those are typically uh, austenitized around 850. And uh, this, this boundary, ACM boundary, gets shifted because of the comb content of that steel. So, um, uh, so you definitely austenitize uh, where you're forming semitime. And here's an example of that. Uh, uh, of, of that, that type of microstructure. Uh, very fine carbide particles are produced and uh, uh, basically what that, what, what that does is remove carbon from the austenite. So the, uh, the, the carbon now is in these carbide particles and there's too small amount of carbon uh, to uh, cause the precipitation on the S of the grain boundary. So, so this uh, gives you, uh, so you can avoid the intergranular fracture by heating uh, in the austenite phase field where uh, uh, you reduce the carbon in the austenite. And then, uh, uh, carbide steels, uh, they have 7.8% carbon. They are in that quench and brittling field. And uh, uh, if you get to a stress level where this develops, then uh, uh, you get this intergranular fracture that nucleates fatigue cracks. And then uh, there's also a nice transformation here. Uh, causing the crack to go transparent or be stable until it reaches the critical size associated with the uh, 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 fracture toughness of the steel. But uh, so uh, uh, you still get uh, intergranular fracture on these carbon steels, but at very high stress levels uh, that are produced by, uh, that are required because of the compressive stresses that are introduced by the formation of uh, the Martin site. Now, uh, uh, the uh, distribution of the residual stresses, uh, the compressive stresses are high at the surface, and then they decrease, and there's a transition at the uh, 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 carbide, uh, the, uh, the case in the core, and sometimes uh, uh, inter, you know, the, the uh, fracture occurs there and uh, at lower stresses than uh, the centigranular fracture because of, of these favorable uh, compressive stresses. So, temp and adrenaline, uh, reduction in softness when quenched carbon steels are tempered now at higher temperatures, between 200 and 400 degrees C. And what's happening in the microstructure is that the retained austenite transforms 
biofusion to cenotype. And uh, the cenotype serves as sites for crack initiation on grain boundaries and uh, uh, within the uh, structure, basically. So uh, uh, this is tempered Markson and Goodman. Here is measurement. You know, these medium carbon steels, 4340, uh, low alloy steels. Uh, this is a chromoly steel, the 41 XX steels. Uh, when they are quenched, they have retained austenite. Uh, basically, uh, the amount of retained austenite is a function of the carbon content. 2% uh, for these uh, chromoly steels, which, which have a lower carbon content. And the 4340 has a higher carbon content. It uh, may have uh, retained austenite of around 4 or 5%. But then, uh, when you temper within the temper in Martin Sand Building range, uh, retained austenite uh, transforms to cenotype. And now you've changed the microstructure and you've introduced particles on which a uh, fracture can occur. Okay, am I doing something wrong here? No, 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 you didn't. Okay, and then, uh, so, so here's 43 force here, uh, temper 315. You, you can see this uh, largely intergranular structure as uh, cenotype has formed uh, uh, by the transformation from the retained austenite. So here is that, there's that, uh, so during tempering, there's actually a phase transformation. Retained austenite transforms uh, on the grain boundaries, especially, uh, and gives you integrated fracture, especially if you have phosphorus, but uh, uh, it also uh, forms uh, within the uh, Marxistic structure. Here's 4340 work that we did. Uh, this is Sharpie V notch energy. This is impact fracture and uh, as a function of temper and temperature. And uh, uh, if you would not have embrittlement, this, uh, uh, as you temper the higher temperatures, uh, the, uh, frank, the uh, impact toughness would increase. But because of the formation of the cenotype and the integrator fracture in some conditions, then uh, uh, that does not occur, and uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but you can see phosphorus is really critical. If the phosphorus content is very low, uh, the impact toughness is consistently higher than uh, uh, where the phosphorus content is uh, higher, basically. So, and then uh, here, uh, it is uh, again sharply being nice impact energy, so it's a function of tempering temperature. And uh, uh, if you temper in that first phase field, uh, 150, between 150, 200, uh, toughness is going up, transition carbides, etc. But now, if you temper at a higher temperature, uh, the impact toughness goes down. But it's still not bad. So the, you, know, you who design steels uh, uh, have to decide whether or not uh, uh, the uh, tempered mark government is uh, sufficiently uh, detrimental. Okay, so the, the mitigation. Uh, keep phosphorus contents low. This, this is really critical. Avoid tempered temperatures right in applications where you use toughness may cause fracture. That means you who are the mechanical engineers have to understand the conditions uh, for your uh, application of the steel. Use steel. Another uh, use, uh, another approach that has been used is to add high silicon, add 1% silicon. And, uh, uh, and, and what the silicon does is uh, it does not go into the crystal structure of the cementite. And uh, uh, so you don't get the carbides formed in the same tempering range where uh, the temper of occurs. 
And this is used in aircraft landing gear, a severe uh, application that we all depend on, basically. And uh, uh, over the years, the, the addition of uh, silicon, uh, and that's called 300 m steel, it's the same as 4340, but now here's 1% silicon and uh, 1.45 and 1.8% silicon. And uh, so uh, that has been extremely important. We all depend on this uh, aircraft landing gear, severe application, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, market site, tempered, low temperatures, uh, has the strength that uh, uh, serves that case. And to avoid uh, temper marks and equipment, uh, this steel has been developed. And, and there are other steels now uh, that uh, are good for landing gear. And then uh, temper equipment. This is uh, an equipment condition that develops in part of the lilac farm steels. After a long time of tempering, the surface of slow cooling or heavy parts through the temperature range now, uh, which is much higher. Remember the uh, sketch of the tempering temperature versus carbon content. And uh, now, uh, co segregation of the impurity elements phosphorus, antimony, arsenic, uh, uh, tin antimony, uh, they diffuse to these arsenic grain boundaries, as do some of the substitutional alum elements. And uh, uh, this, uh, so, but it, but it takes a high temperature because part of this embrittlement is that the substitutional elements, which are large atoms, have to uh, uh, diffuse. And, and, and this goes way back uh, to uh, uh, the Krupp Steel Company. And uh, uh, the Krupp Steel Company made steels that would shoot further and further into France. And uh, uh, to do that, they had to harden. They had to add alloy elements. And, uh, and their guns were blowing up. So, Tempar Gilliman has been called Krupp Krankheit, uh, Krupp Sickness, basically. And uh, that's where it started. And uh, it's in heavy section steels that slowly cool or are held here, turbines, uh, etc., for power generation, uh, uh, held in, in this uh, uh, range, basically. So, uh, but the but substitution alloy elements are, are required here. And uh, 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 what happens if you have a sharp EV notch test, if you get embrittlement that's produced, the uh, double the brittle transition goes up higher temperatures. And uh, so uh, close to room temperature, you may actually get uh, quite brittle performance, basically. And uh, here's very early work. Uh, these, these curves show that around this 550 uh, centigrade range, that the transition temperature goes up. In other words, you're getting more, you know, what, what this all means here is that you're getting more uh, brittle behavior at higher, higher uh, temperatures. So the transition temperature is going to higher temperatures, so on. Uh, and you see this right around this 550. Uh, you go higher, no problem. You go, you go lower, it takes much, uh, much longer time. So, uh, uh, so that's temperature and brittling. And uh, the mitigation related to CO chemistry. Keep phosphorus, tin, arsenic, antimony low. Obviously, arsenic does not sound good to us, and it's not good for steel. And, uh, uh, and, and it's very important uh, to keep these elements all very low. Uh, in, in this day and age, phosphorus and tin are, are probably the major elements that you might find in steel. Uh, now, molybdenum is good. Molybdenum may tie up. And uh, we saw yesterday that uh, uh, 
uh, uh, chrome polysteels are used, uh, 540, uh, and, uh, uh, and the molybdenum is good because it combines the, with the phosphorus and pulls it out of uh, solution in the austin. And then, uh, uh, so and then another approach that's been used more recently, every was very important that uh, these uh, turbines were blowing up uh, uh, high speed uh, rotation, but the, the disintegrator embrittlements uh, caused uh, uh, severe accidents and the electric power uh, industry financed this, this research. Okay. Now, hydrogen and water. Okay, we saw a little bit about this uh, yesterday. Good questions. It introduced my talk, Giovanni. Uh, uh, she introduced my talk beautifully. And uh, here's my view of it. Uh, pulling out of the literature, Interante uh, uh, had published, there are no favorable effects of hydrogen in steel. And uh, as emphasized yesterday, there's a vast literature on hydrogen and Goldman, uh, continuing conferences. There will be one in Serbia, is that, is that correct? And uh, hydrogen uh, and Goldman will be a big topic of, of that conference. And this section discusses continue. We, we do know a lot. We don't know everything. Uh, so, uh, research, modeling has to continue. But uh, we do know a lot. And, and what, what do we know? Uh, hydrogen may enter the heat treated steel in many ways, may be responsible for various types of brittle fracture. And integrated fracture, pyrosine green boundaries, and medium carbon, low temperature tempered steels, bolt steels. Uh, fasteners, etc. And then here, here's an example: 4340 steel charged with hydrogen, and uh, you see this intergranular fracture uh, in this ultra high strength 4340 steel. The uh, uh, that carbon content gets you to a very high level, but uh, if you have hydrogen, uh, you get brittle intergranular fracture, as shown here. And then uh, uh, lower carbon steels, uh, there's cleavage, it's transgranular. That's another story. Uh, another story is that uh, uh, around the inclusion particles, during testing, uh, brittle fracture can occur uh, as perhaps hydrogen moves these regions of hydrostatic uh, stress, uh, tensile stresses. Uh, and this happens in heat affected zones. Well, of all the structures, it happens uh, in the lower carbon steels, and it happens in uh, medium carbon steels if they are tempered at uh, very high temperatures. Now, here's fundamental uh, aspect. This is under equilibrium condition. The solubility of hydrogen as a function of temperature in iron, low carbon steel. And uh, at high temperatures, there are maybe 20, 30 parts per million hydrogen absorbed in liquid steel. So liquid steel, that's how you start making steel, steel making. Uh, liquid steel welding, basically. And uh, uh, that's one way you can get hydrogen in the steel. And then the solubility drops, body center cubic structure uh, uh, de uh, decreases again uh, in the austenite, which is face center cubic crystal structure, and then drops down to alpha. And, and look at this. At 600 C, under equilibrium conditions, the solubility of hydrogen is only one part per nine. So, why is hydrogen a problem? And uh, it is a problem uh, 
for a number of effects. And, uh, and, and this curve can be used to uh, actually control and eliminate hydrogen. Uh, and now, one thing about hydrogen, it has tremendous mobility in a crystal structure. It can move through uh, austenite, it can move through ferrite, it can move through marcasite crystal structure. And this is a plot of the fusion coefficient, which is a measure of that as a function of temperature. And hydrogen uh, in a millisecond can move to uh, green boundaries quickly. Uh, and uh, it moves to regions of hydrostatic tensile stresses, where the lattice is expanded somewhat. And uh, at the root of noxious, for example, in fasteners. Now, carbon nitrogen, they can diffuse through solid crystal structures too, relatively uh, rapid. But the substitutional elements, like uh, the big atoms, chrome, nickel, molybdenum, manganese, their diffusivity is very low. So anything uh, that involves these alloy carbides uh, is associated with uh, uh, basically uh, high temperature tempering or cooling through uh, high temperature in heavy sections. But this is a fundamental. These, so, the, so these, okay. Now, hydrogen lowers cohesive bond strength between atoms. This gets into the world of physics, I'm not a physicist, uh, and prevents or prevents dislocation of motion and plastic accommodation of stress. I pointed this out on the stress strain curves. Fracture occurs during sustained or slow rate loading. Hydrogen has very high diffusion, diffusivity. It can ha actually happen during a tensile test. Hydrogen can diffuse at slow strain rate testing, uh, basically. And then, uh, uh, and, and this is another reason why it is a problem, despite its very low equilibrium solubility in the crystal structure. It diffuses the regions of hydrostatic tensile stresses, at notches, thread roots, and when it reaches a high enough level, uh, cracking occurs, embrittlement occurs. And uh, very early work showed that uh, 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 you know, this is work by uh, Triano and his uh, co-workers. Uh, this is uh, uh, stress versus time. And uh, one of the things we know about hydrogen, it can happen uh, as a function of time. In other words, uh, uh, short exposures, uh, uh, strength is very high. Of course, it depends on how much hydrogen is in the steel. And, uh, uh, but uh, in time, the hydrogen diffuses to notches in these regions of hydrostatic stress and uh, strength decreases. So it is the one failure mechanism where time under stress is important. All these other mechanisms, when you hit the, the critical level of stress, fracture occurs. But uh, hydrogen. Uh, make a fuse. Okay. So, hydrogen and microstructure are hardened steel. Now, another thing that makes hydrogen uh, so pervasive is that all the microstructural components I showed you earlier in martensitic uh, microstructural systems, they are attractive and they serve as traps. And this is documented, this uh, persona. You know, the, documented this in number of years. Uh, you have reversible traps where hydrogen can uh, diffuse to and also leave and create new problems. And uh, dislocations, green boundaries, solute atoms. But then there are irreversible traps. And they have high interaction energy with hydrogen. Hydrogen cannot leave unless heated to much higher temperature than room temperature. 
So this is ultimately one way in which you can perhaps develop seals that have low resistance to hydrogen ability. Now, uh, this locations principal cracks, and uh, they may prevent uh, cross slip, etc. Uh, hydrogen to the dislocate to the screw dislocations. Uh, but it's also been shown that uh, hydrogen enhances dislocation mobility, but because it uh, prevents cross slip, uh, then uh, uh, you don't get uh, uh, the, the plasticity that you need for high ductilities. And uh, one of the uh, techniques that has been recently used is thermal desorption spectrometry, actually measuring hydrogen as it comes off. Uh, during heating, and, uh, and there's two uh, plots. This is hydrogen desorption ratio. You have low temperature peaks, uh, and uh, so the hydrogen can come and it can go, create more problems. And then there's high temperature, uh, more uh, irreversible peaks where the hydrogen really sticks to the microstructural component. So. Uh, that's another aspect. Now, hydrogen problems, mitigation, flaking, heavy sections. Uh, uh, all this hydrogen that's introduced during steel making uh, may end up uh, in large sections, can't be moved. And so uh, one approach has been to vacuum it, degas liquid steel. Uh, and that removes uh, uh, hydrogen. So those of you that buy steel are responsible for buying steel. You know, certainly the fact that it has uh, been vacuumed to gas is important. Uh, coal cracking in wells, heat affected zone. Uh, uh, actually use, uh, you don't want Martin site, so you want uh, low carbon equivalents. H2S, solid gas or oil, related cracking. Uh, we heard about this yesterday. Tempered Martin City steel. Uh, at high temperatures. Get rid of those dislocations. And of course, what that requires is high temperature tempering, and so you're also losing strength. So uh, there's challenges to develop high strength uh, with uh, microstructures that uh, have very low dislocation densities. Uh, dislocations are removed by temperature. And then uh, atmospheric salt water, acid rain, uh, introduction of hydrogen, what you do is coat from the accidents of uh, carbon, uh, of hydrogen, or temperate high temperatures. And then hydrogen equivalent through electroplating, uh, you bake actually. And then the carbon does, we saw in the equilibrium diagram, that the carbon, uh, that the hydrogen wants to leave. And, and so this, this actually works, uh, basically. Now, Okay, hydrogen boom continues. Here, here's a little case study. I want to finish with this. Uh, the location, this is on the San Francisco uh, Oakland Bay Bridge. And uh, it was an earthquake resistant modification of that major bridge, uh, basically. And uh, connecting sections of that bridge, there were high strength steel anchor bolts. 4140, uh, harness 41 at the surface. Three inch diameter bolts. If there's uh, uh, hydrogen introduced uh, during the steel making, three inches is uh, a fair distance for the hydrogen to diffuse, basically. Hot thick galvanized uh, would prevent uh, the uh, hydrogen from leaving. So uh, in March, uh, uh, 2013, fairly high hardness still, meaning there's lots of dislocations, basically. 32 of 96 anchor rods, bolts, joining these sections fail. The phase of installation under tension. Hundreds of thousands of dollars expense, maybe, maybe a lot more, basically, because of this hydrogen in these susceptible type steels, uh, uh, basically. And uh, there's the bridge. 
made the newspapers. Not all of your work ever makes the newspapers, uh, basically. <coughs> but uh, uh, this, this is the Bay Bridge. And here, with the SCM failure analysis, uh, shows the intergranular cracking associated with this, this level of uh, heat-treated steel, high-strength steel, uh, and the bolting. So, uh, I want to finish up now. Uh, the conditions, namely processing, working, welding, heat treatment, electroplating, uh, microstructures, steel chemistry, residual stresses, empirically, experimentally, are well known for intergranular embrittlements that occur. So you can mitigate, you can avoid it by careful selection of steel, careful selection of heat treatment uh, conditions. And, uh, uh, and, and so now we, we do want to model, we want to develop better alloys. Uh, it's important that known state of the art be incorporated, you know, what I'm just describing, sort of the state of the art, in the selection and processing and design of applications that require high strengths and fracture resistance of steels with tempered, more safe structures. So uh, interdisciplinary efforts between steel makers, metallurgists, manufacturing engineers, experts, fracture mechanics, uh, mechanical engineers are essential. And uh, uh, so uh, it, you know, it, it is important uh, for uh, mechanical design and modeling to uh, incorporate some of this state of the art. And then uh, we need more research. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, the relation of stress state to deformation and fracture, uh, many components in microstructure. And, and as I showed you, these microstructures are uh, complex. Uh, there are many uh, components. Now, uh, we're all looking for funding, basically. And uh, uh, financial funding uh, is there because of, uh, and, and this is why hydrogen development is, we hear so much about it, so many people working on it. Because the economy of production, you can pick the right heat treated conditions. Safety, basically. You don't want hydrogen factors in vehicles or whatever. Uh, reduce vehicle weight and benefits will include steel consistency, part reliability, potential improvements in mechanical performance. Uh, avoid costly failures. The failures are increasing, hopefully. Fewer and fewer failures, but uh, they are uh, still present. And uh, then uh, acknowledgments, honored to have been invited to give this talk. Thank the organizing committee, especially professors Donato Ferrero, Francisco Ficato, Bianco Belli, for the invitation and their help. And, uh, and, and what I talk about is many, many years putting all these facets together. Any, anybody working on a, uh, a short-term project is, can only look at one or two items, but, uh, but what I've tried to do is put together uh, a large amount of understanding fundamentals uh, that help us understand this uh, intergranular fracture. So I uh, thank my students, colleagues, and the knowledge base generated by all members of the international steel community. And that means you out there. You are part of this uh, international community of uh, steel researchers and applications. So uh, that's, and, and I recognize that as being very important. So with that, thank you for your attention. And, uh,